Charles Severance was born in September 1960 and grew up in Fairfax County, Virginia. After getting his mechanical engineering degree from the University of Virginia, he worked a series of odd jobs. Charles had a son in April 1999, but the mother of his child left him in 2000 after consistent emotional abuse and unpredictable behavior on Charles's part. He then lost his son's custody. Charles also ran for office in Alexandria, Virginia, in 1996 and 2000. On the campaign trail, Severance displayed unusual and erratic behavior. Severance appeared at campaign events dressed entirely in black with a cloak and sunglasses and during Severance's campaigns for mayor, the city manager and police chief assigned an undercover officer to follow Democratic candidate and eventual mayor Kerry Donnelly. On several occasions during his campaigns, Severance became violent. In one instance during a forum in 1996, Severance picked up an American flag and pointed the spiked finial at Representative Jim Moran before running out of the building. At another forum in 2000, Severance punched one of the organizers. In all three of Severance's campaigns, he was defeated. It's Veterans Day, 2013, and 69-year-old government worker Ron Kirby is doing some DIY. He had a problem with the sink. His kitchen sink was drip-in. He actually tried to fix it himself and was unable to do that. So, he called the plumber. His wife had gone out to an appointment. So, you know, he's all alone in his house, waiting for the plumber to arrive. The plumber shows up and is out in the driveway and calls Ron Kirby, and there's no answer. And so he ends up going on to another call. Later in the afternoon, Ron Kirby's son shows up for a lunch appointment. When he walks in the house, he yells out for his dad, but when he turns the corner, he sees his dad, Ron Kirby, laying on the floor in a pool of blood. When the ambulance arrives, they rush him to the hospital, only to pronounce him deceased a little bit after he arrives. Ron had two bullet holes in his chest from a 22 caliber firearm. When detectives looked at the crime scene, they found a total of four bullets had been fired. Two had missed. They think that the criminal had knocked on the door, Ron opened the door, and the criminal started firing at him. Detectives discover Ron Kirby's phone. They noticed a missed call from that morning. It was the plumber. The plumber called Mr. Kirby to tell him that he was on his way. This was at 11.32. Ten minutes later at 11.42, the plumber arrives at Mr. Kirby's home and there's no answer. So, there's a very small window between 11.32 and 11.42 that this crime could have occurred. One of the first things that investigators want to do, is figure out who might have had a motivation to kill Ron Kirby, so they asked the family, and the family said they knew of no one that would want to hurt Ron. It's very, very rare to see a 22 used in a homicide. But there was a prior case in their area that a 22 had been used, and it was still unsolved. And that was the murder of Nancy Dunning. Between the Nancy Dunning case and the Ron Kirby case, there was over a 10-year span. But there was a 911 call on that case, it's December the 3rd, 2003, Okay. 
Nancy Dunning had been shot three times. She had a bullet hole in her chest. She had a bullet hole in her left arm and she had a bullet hole behind her ear. Nancy was at the bottom of the stairs in the foyer right by her front door. There was nothing disturbed inside the home. There were no shell casings to be found on the scene. There was no evidence of anybody even coming into the home. The day that she was murdered Nancy Dunning was shopping at Target for a family in need for Christmas. Detectives went to the Target to find video footage of her in the store. They are looking for some type of detail that's going to stand out to them. Something that will help them identify who killed Nancy Dunning. Nancy arrived at the Target at the Potomac Yard Shopping Center at around 10.15 a.m. She was obviously trying to in there, get her shopping finished, and be done with it. When she walked out of the store, a gentleman actually walked behind her. He's a white male, wearing a leather jacket. He leaves shortly after Nancy leaves, having purchased nothing. He just seems very out of place and very odd. Detectives go back through the footage for any other sign of a suspicious individual. The person walked into the store and then noticed Nancy. So, he stopped to tie his shoe. But, his shoe didn't need to be tied. He just stopped to do that to kind of give himself some time for Nancy to keep going into the store. He looked like he may have been in his forties. One interesting thing about him is his hair. He had widow peaks and it kind of made him stand out. When she was going to check out of the store, he kind of walked past the registers and then followed her out. It appears that is following her, there was really no other explanation as to why this person would be in there. But he was still an unknown. The footage was grainy. It was not really refined. It was released to the media but by the time it was blown up, that footage just was not strong enough to identify him. Without any solid leads, the Dunning case went cold. Despite the 10-year gap, both murders share striking similarities. When Ron Kirby was murdered, there were so many elements that matched the murder of Nancy Dunning. It happened right in the middle of the day. There's a knock at the door. There's the killer with a gun happened to be using the exact same kind of very rare ammunition. These two murders were in the same type of upscale neighborhood. They were within a mile and a half of each other. They appeared very similar, but it had been over 10 years. Which would beg the question of what happened, why is there that 10 year gap if they are linked? They called the plumber to see if he recognizes this guy. When the plumber arrived, he said he saw an older white male with a beard in the area. Didn't recognize him, didn't know who he was. Was it this man? Without a positive ID, detectives are left with little to go on. Three months after Ron Kirby's murder, there was another call. It was the Lodato home. Someone had been shot. It was Ruth Ann, the owner of the house. But she was still alive, on the stretcher on the way to the hospital, the detective asked if she saw who did it, she said she saw him. The detective asked if she knew him, and she said no. Shortly after that, they had pronounced that she had passed away. This family had a live-in caretaker, and she was there when this happened. Ruth Ann was at home, getting ready to go to a doctor's appointment. Around 11.30, Ruthann heard a knock at the door. Ruthann's elderly mother and caretaker were in a room close by. There are shots immediately. He caretaker came out and she sees this white male with a beard. The caretaker is shot in her left arm. The suspect continues to shoot at her, until he suddenly stops, turns around and leaves. The caretaker then goes in and gets Ruthann's mother and takes her to a neighbor. She went back to the house, heroically and selflessly to be with Ruthann, to be at her side until the police arrived. 
they were able to recover the projectiles from the scene. They sent them to the lab and asked that they be compared with the projectiles from the Ronald Kirby murder and the Nancy Dunning murder. As they wait for the ballistics report, detectives canvass the area. They are looking for eyewitnesses. A short distance away, there was a video camera located that filmed the street. They collected the footage. The ballistics report came back, and it was the same type of projectiles in all three cases. But it said that they were not fired from the same firearm, but it was the same type, a 22 revolver. They're all definitely from the same guy. They looked at the target video and the sketch. Eleven years had passed. He did not look the same. But one thing he couldn't hide was the widow peak. They made a decision to put that sketch out to the public and ask for tips. In the meantime they take a look at the surveillance they collected from the neighbors. They see this car going west on Braddock Road, right around the time of the murder. And it's acting different. It was supposed to be 15 miles an hour. But this car is traveling faster than all the other cars. They identified the vehicle as a red Ford Escort wagon. Not an unusual vehicle, but it was older. When you slowed it down and looked, you see what appears to possibly be a white male with a beard driving that car. But they were not able to identify the license plate. One tip came in for a gentleman with a beard that's acting weird and lives near where Ruth and Lodato lived. They went out to interview this person that they received a tip on. He had an alibi. But that person also went on to say, I know a person who looks like that sketch by the name of Charles Severance. So they go give this guy a visit. They applied for a search warrant, and then went to Ashburn to Mr. Severance's girlfriend's house. But Charles Severance wasn't there. When searching the home, there was a receipt for a North American Arms 22 revolver. It's the same as the murder weapon. But the firearm was not there. There were other firearms in the house that were recovered, but not that one. So, it really concerned them that when he left, he chose to take that firearm with him. While we were looking for him doing search warrants, Charles Severance was moving, but they didn't know where he was going. They knew he had credit cards, and he had bank accounts, so, they were able to put alerts on those cards. When they were used, we would be notified about how they were used and where they were used. On March 12th, the investigative team was notified by the Uniformed Secret Service. Charles Severance left his house and went into Washington, D.C. He drove his Ford Escort wagon. He took his bicycle off of his car and bicycled to the Russian embassy in Washington, D.C. He said he was seeking asylum because Alexandria is persecuting him. He was turned away from the Russian embassy and a Secret Service person was able to get pictures of Charles Severance. The Secret Service forwarded these photographs to detectives in Alexandria. They had someone they believed was a serial killer. And had a community that was clearly in danger. They reached out to the Wheeling Police Department and then the Federal Bureau of Investigation Surveillance team out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Alexandria detectives pass on the pictures of Charles Severance outside the Russian embassy and warn officers that he may be armed. There's a bicycle in the photo that stuck out as well. The bicycle was a blue bike with a yellow strap around the handle. Across from the police department leaned up against a pole outside the Ohio County Library is a blue bike with a yellow strap. Due to the safety factor of Mr. Severance possibly being armed, they didn't want Mr. Severance to see a uniformed officer walk in. They want a couple of our undercover officers that are in the area to go in. When one of the plain clothes officers went in, they spotted Mr. Severance on one of the computers. The plain clothes officer grabbed Mr. Severance from behind and then that's when the uniformed officers went up and placed him into custody with handcuffs. He was very calm. He didn't say anything. 
After Charles was charged with the three murders, the prosecution stated that he was angry after losing his son's custody and set out to attack people he thought were the ruling class in Alexandria. They also believed that Charles chose his victims at random because there was no known relationship between him and his victims. But trying the case in court was an entirely different task altogether. The murder weapon was never recovered, and there was no physical evidence that tied Charles to the murder. At Charles's trial in 2015, the prosecution's case hinged on eyewitness testimony and ballistics evidence. Dorcas took the stand to identify Charles as the man who killed Ruth Ann and injured her. There was further eyewitness testimony that placed him in the area the days before and on the day of Ruth Ann's murder. While the murder weapon was never recovered, the bullets that killed the victims were of the same type used with different guns. The prosecution stated that Charles owned a gun similar to that many years ago and, more recently, had his girlfriend buy two more. He couldn't buy one himself because of a prior felony conviction. The prosecution also pointed to some of Charles's recovered writing. A poem called, Parable of the Knocker, had a line that said, Knock, and the door will open. Knock. Talk. Enter. Kill. Exit. Murder. Wisdom. The prosecution believed that this described the three murders. The defense, in return, stated that none of Charles's writings mentioned the victims by name and added that he dealt with a personality disorder with mixed paranoid and schizotypal features. In October 2015, a jury found Charles guilty of ten charges that included the capital murders of Ruth Ann and Ronald and the first-degree murder of Nancy. In January 2016, a judge sentenced Charles to three life terms plus an additional 48 years. A spokesperson for Ruth Ann's family said of the victim's loved ones, I think the families want to move on, as they always have. As per prison records, Charles remains incarcerated at Marion Correctional Treatment Center in Smith County, Virginia.